Hello everyone, welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday the 14th of February. Happy Valentine's Day to everyone. Today's topic is Lucid Press and our special guest is Andreas Johansson. I'm one of the show hosts, Lori Moffat, along with Peggy George and Tammy Moore. Thank you, Tammy, for doing closed captioning. I'm going to turn the mic over to Peggy to introduce Andreas and to ask the newbie question. Well, hello to all of you, and welcome to our show on Lucid Press. We're so excited to have Andreas here with us today to share his experiences with Lucid Press and to give us some tips about how to use this amazing tool. He has had an incredibly busy week presenting at conferences and a tech uh, district tech day, and uh, so we. Really really appreciate that he's fitting us into his schedule today. He was born and raised in Sweden, and that makes my heart go pity pat because all of my family was born and raised in Sweden too. And he moved with his family to the United States when he was in high school. He brings a really unique cultural perspective to his approach in education as he strives to merge the different world views that shaped his own experience. His interest lies in creating dynamic events that shape the way we teach, helping teachers effectively and practically, keyword, integrate technology into their environment, which ultimately impacts the young learners that we serve, and that's what we're all about. He lives in Talmadge, Ohio, with his wife, Jay, who is a freelance copywriter and editor, and their two children, Emily and Oscar. And of course, he enjoys spending time with his family. He enjoys hiking in the outdoors and even working around the house. So we are just so happy to have you here with us today, Andreas. And I'm going to move on to our newbie question and have you kind of lead us into your presentation by talking about why you think it's important for educators to know about publishing tools for their classrooms and their professional lives too. Thanks so much. Take it away. Okay, well good morning. My name is Andreas. I am the uh, Director of Tech Integration at Kenston Local Schools. Um, which is a sort of a medium-sized uh, school district here in Ohio. We have about 3,200 students. Um, <clears throat> so I'm, ex I'm excited to be with you here today to kind of talk about one of the tools that really, really work well for us. Um, we are a uh, Google Apps for Education school, so we have uh, moved everything into the cloud. Um, but Google Apps uh, have a few areas where it doesn't sort of excel, and publishing is definitely one of those. But coming back to the newbie question, you know, why is it important for educators to know about publishing tools um, for both classrooms uh, and for their professional and public lives or you know, personal lives? Um, it's important because that, that's what we are asked to do today. Uh, a lot of our teachers in our district publish newsletters on a weekly or maybe monthly basis. And it has been the case that they've used other tools like Microsoft Word or something like that. And that doesn't really didn't really work. Um, it doesn't uh, integrate well with the internet. There's no um, super simple way to kind of go from the document to being able to ship it out to parents or students or whoever wants to read it. So that's where Lucid Press comes in. I'm also a big Lucid Chart tool uh, user. I use that a lot for uh, all sorts of um, techy stuff, I guess, you know, network diagrams and flow charts and things like that. And so Lucid Press is a tool that was developed. Uh, just a little bit after Lucid Chart, it's by the same company um, out of um, out of the West Coast. And so, uh, it, why should we want to publish? Well, we want to publish because it, we want to get our message out there. Uh, our district is running for a levy, so in the state of Ohio, we have to ask uh, the voters for money every so often in order to be able to uh, continue to operate. 
And so the benefit is, you know, hey, here's what's actually happening in my classroom, and uh, it, it's an easy way to ship it out and tell the world sort of uh, what's going on so that they can find out. And then, uh, you know, some of the other benefits, it's free. Lucid Press is totally free. It integrates with your Google Drive. So if you have a Google Drive, then you're, you're set. And it's also a modern uh, publishing tool. I saw in the chat a little bit earlier, someone mentioned uh, Microsoft Publisher. Um, and Publisher was certainly a good tool back in the day. Um, but it's 2015, and they have sort of stopped uh, updating Publisher a long time ago. Most people don't have Publisher, and uh, Publisher doesn't interface with all of the different um, things that we want to do today. So I'll show you how to do sort of uh, you know live video, for example. You can have a, di a digital document that can have a video right inside of it. And so if you're delivering this out to tablets or mobile phones or um, computers, or you end up printing it out. It kind of works. It works for every customer that you might want to ship your newsletter or your your publication to. So, all right. So let's take a look. Yeah, and uh, and uh, Peggy said the publisher doesn't work on your Mac. That's right. And so that's the other huge benefit is that Lucid Press works in uh, in the web. So it works on the web. So it's going to work on any entity that you have. So. Um, if you uh, have a Mac or PC or a Chromebook, it doesn't matter. It works on all of that uh, and it interfaces and uh, it just kind of kind of just works. So it's a great tool to have um, around. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to keep up with the chat. It's, you're right, it is going 100 miles an hour, so we'll we'll do our best. But I'm gonna switch over to application switching or to the application sharing, right? So. Let's see. What you should see is uh, my browser. You should see the uh, my my Twitter feed here. Let me see if I can move this stuff over so that I can still see it. Yeah. Okay. Good. Moving some stuff around to get more more chat. Okay. Uh, there. Can you see? Uh, can you see my Twitter page? Can someone give me a thumbs up? So I know. Load it pretty fast. Okay. Good. All right, great. So we're ready to go. So that's me on Twitter. And if you're interested, in this picture in the background, that's where I grew up in the little fishing village of Tulakov in, in southern Sweden. So I look at that every day, and I'm like, oh, why can't I be there? Because like Peggy said, or someone said, I think it, in Ohio today, it's going to be zero degrees and snow. So there we go. All right, let me take you to uh, Lucid Press. Lucidpress.com. Um, once you've logged in, uh, it's going to take you to here. And I just want to talk really quickly about sort of logging in. Uh, you can log in and create an account with Lucid Press for free, uh, no problem. Uh, or if you have a uh, Google account, if you have a Google Apps account, for example, you just simply authenticate with a Google Apps account. Now, if you're a Google Apps for Education school, you want to talk to your uh, Google Apps person at the district and say, hey, have you enabled it for our district? And if so, how do we get into it? Because there's a couple of different ways you can do it. And if not, then uh, just go to lucidpress.com and sign up for a free account, and uh, and off you go. But I want to I want to take it from there because once you sign in and you get into your account, then uh, this is what you'll see. So <clears throat> a little bit different uh, from if you have been in a publisher or if you're working in Word or some other tool. Uh, it's very visual. So you come right into sort of a uh, document view. It shows you all the documents that you have. And so from a visual perspective, you can right away tell, like, OK, this is my newsletter. This is my poster. This is something else that I've worked on. And then you can get back into that document. You can also start a new document by clicking this green button in the top left-hand corner. And I'm going to show you a couple different things here and then uh, show you some of the um, the features of Lucid Press. Uh, first off, I wanted to start with, uh, we have a professional development day on Monday. And uh, so what I do for our teachers, um, I just create a certificate of attendance. And of course, I do that in Lucid Press because it's ready to go and it's easy to work with. And so here's just an example of what you can work on uh, within Lucid Press. Th this took me probably, I don't know, maybe 15 minutes to create had some logos, text, things like that. But then I have it, and it's ready to go, and it's uh, super simple. So going back to the question that we started with, how do you create? Uh, my way of thinking about creation is, is I pick the, the right tool for me. And that might, uh, might not be the same for you. But Lucid Press certainly is a tool that works really, really well. Um, but just keep that in mind. Uh, Peggy mentioned that my wife does copywriting and editing, and so she uses very different tools from me. So she's in uh, you know, InDesign a lot. She's in some of the other Adobe Suite tools 
a lot when they, they work for different clients. But those tools are not uh, right for me. I don't really need InDesign. I don't do uh, super complicated stuff. Um, I just like to have a tool that works really well and that can, that can interface with uh, lots of different people and, and so on and so forth. Speaking of which, one of the uh, features is that you can share a document within uh, LucidPress. So up in the top hand corner, you see uh, a couple of buttons there. One is collaborate, the other one's preview, and then there's a publish button, and then you have some analytics. So if you wanted to collaborate, and I'm going to click there. I, I hope this one shows up for you. It's sort of a, a pop-up on my screen. Um, but essentially, you can control who has access to your document at any time. Matches pretty closely to what you would do in Google. So uh, you just invite someone. All you need is their email. You can also just generate a link. Um, and you just say, hey, you can edit the document, and off you go. And so quite a lot of people are using it that way at our district where they write a newsletter together. So the entire third grade will put together a newsletter. And one of them starts it, and then um, just off they go, and they can work and fill in their different sections. Um, and then, of course, you can come back into this collaborate button or collaborate uh, box and then say, well, now we don't want um, Susie and Joey and Maggie to have access to the document, and you can remove it just like in Google. So it's great. Um, this is an example. I just want to show you some examples before we get started. This is an example of the newsletter that I do uh, for my staff. I do it once a quarter just to not, uh, I don't want to bombard their email um, inboxes. But I keep it all um, electronic, so I don't print this out. I still format it um, according to what, what could print it out, because I know that once I email this to staff, some of them do like to print it, and so I keep that in mind, so I keep the formatting um, according to sort of a print newsletter. But as you've noticed, and I'm going to zoom in here, you've noticed that within the document itself, I can hyperlink things. So this blue underline here, you know, goes right to where I need them to go. And so it's a great way for me to extend uh, something for my staff. So this one talks about um, your Google password and how to change it. And so I can ship them right there by using a hyperlink within the document. So while working in a digital document, um, you get some benefits that you don't uh, get in print at all. The template here I have just kind of designed myself. And so I have you know this just in. And then on the second page is kind of I do a spotlight on a couple different things. So again, uh, quarter two is for passwords and general improvement, and then teacher tools. and and then at the bottom, I have like a bulletin board and a save the date for different things that we do. So, um, you know, it's just a simple newsletter template. I'll show you here in a little bit where you can find all sorts of crazy templates um, that you can start off with if you wanted to. Um, <clears throat> one of the questions here I see uh, from uh, BCD Tech, right? Maureen, maybe. I like that it's printable. It's a way to include all preferences, right? And so that uh, I, our district, we still have about 240 staff, and so I know that some of them uh, want uh, to, uh, you know, print it out and read it on their own time, and that's okay. Peggy has a question: Are there lots of fonts to choose from? Yes. Um, how many fonts do you want? I'll show you that in a little bit here. Uh, let me show you first uh, how to get this into other formats, because that's something that uh, you will ask in a little bit anyways. So one is you can publish. And if you were to publish it, uh, you could publish it straight up to a live document. You can embed it. You can uh, get a link. And when you do that, you just publish it. It becomes a digital document. And you can um, ship that to whoever you want in an email, and they view it digitally. Um, and then you can update your, uh, your digital document. You can use a custom link. So if you don't want it to be pub.lucidpress.com and this crazy number, you can name it something else. Uh, so for example, I can go in and say uh, Pathfinder Q2. And then it's always going to check. See how it checks? OK, that's available. So I say OK, good. And now if I copy that and, and I update it, um, I'll paste that into the chat there, and you should be able to, to get to it, I think. So you can try that. But don't spend too much time looking at it, I guess, for now. <laughs> OK. Another way, another thing that I do all the time, so this is what I do. I, uh, I pull it down as a PDF. So I go up, I click File, and then I say Download As. And then I get uh, an option here. And hopefully, you can see the options. My options are PDF, 
PNG or JPEG. So again, I can pull down as a PDF document. I can pull down as a PNG or JPEG, which are image files. And then my resolution, I can either have a screen resolution of 100 dpi, print resolution of 300 dpi. I always go with the print resolution. Um, something you should know is that at least in the state of Ohio, uh, legal documents should be 300 dpi. So that's not that this is a legal document, but I, uh, I, the higher the better. And then again, the content, you want to do the whole document, you want to do page range, you want the current page, so on and so forth. And when you download that, it will download into your computer and then you just ship it out. It's super simple. So that's what I tend to do. I tend to create it here, I download it as a PDF and I email that out. Uh, I also publish on the website and things like that. So, all right. Questions so far? Just uh, put them in the chat and I'll, uh, I'll see. I think I've been... In keeping up. Uh, Wes made a good comment, I think, you know, next gen Microsoft Publisher. Yeah, absolutely. And I would say it's not it's not Publisher. Uh, it, it's uh, designed last year. It's uh, closer to InDesign, Adobe InDesign, than it would be Publisher, um, specifically for your direct publishing capability. Something to keep in mind, too, and we talked about that, about, um, you know, have you published a newsletter yourself? State of Ohio's Common Core, part of the uh, language arts uh, curriculum or language arts standards for the Common Core is to have students publish. And uh, the way I read that is uh, students need to publish. And that means publishing out for the world to see. It doesn't mean uh, publish kind of here's a paper that could be published, but I'm turning it into my teacher. It means straight up uh, publish it to the world. And so this is a one click for our students to be able to do that. Uh, some more questions. Uh, what are the page sizes? I'll show you in a bit here. Can you make a page long enough to make an infographic? You bet. Um, you can. Um, and then, uh, Peggy, can you insert images, embed videos, newsletters? Yes. So coming up. So let me take you to a new document. So back here, I'm in uh, sort of my overview documents. I've clicked the green button, and I'm now in a blank print document. So this is your typical starting point, depending on what you want to do. Um, if I, and I'll come back to the templates in a little bit, but I'll show you uh, some of the basic features. Uh, the main difference between working in a Word, uh, you know, like a Word document or a Word processing document and an actual page layout document is that everything works as a text box. So I'm going to start with the tools over here on the left hand side. Uh, first off, I have adding a page. So um, if I'm just in a blank template, uh, I'm just going to add a, a single page, and now I have two pages, and if I need to add another page, I have three pages. Um, so that's how I would add new pages. Uh, and then we're going to skip the scrolling area for now, but with the text, to get text in here, I actually sort of, I do a click and drag, and I bring in what's called a text box. And then I can resize the text box if I need it to. Um, and I do that by hovering over the corner, waiting for the correct arrow to appear, and then kind of clicking and dragging. And then notice that it tells you at the bottom, it tells you the width and the height. And so that's something that's very different than working in Word. And so you can control this text very differently. Uh, hopefully it catches up here. But you can control it very differently when you're working out of a text box. Now notice if I'm selecting the text box, over on the right is where my um, my toolboxes are. So if I've selected a text box, now I get all of the text tools over here on the right. And so I come into my styles. And we're, we won't talk too much about styles today. But just know that you can style up a document if you're working on a really long document. You can style up a document. It makes it very simple to work with. But you know, next I have my font. And so if I go down and I click on my font, I have loaded a long list of fonts. Um, and if you uh, need more than that, you can just add to it. You say you can either upload or manage fonts. And uh, I'm going to click on Manage here. Hopefully you can see this box. When you manage your font, you can go in and essentially turn the fonts on and off. And you say, this is the font. I want to use these fonts, and I want to use these fonts. And you can pick from, let's just say there's lots in there. I don't think. Uh, you will not be able to find what you need. I've also uploaded a few fonts. I have some Adobe specific fonts, and so I like that. But I'm going to come in and, and, and do a new font in here. I'm going to select the text, and I'm going to say, um, let's find, uh, we'll do Action Man, which is a nice sort of cartoony type font. And then I can just increase that. But notice what happened. So now I have size 20. and. Uh, not all the text is fitting in my text box. 
So now I have to resize my text box for the entire text to fit. But what, what I can do working in a text box, I can then make that into a column. I can make it into sort of a, a half page or a quarter page if I wanted to. And I can then work that text with the images that I'm putting in. And notice that this is just Latin text, so uh, don't, don't worry about the Latin text. Uh, that's just a place text. Um, use to see, okay. If you use funky font, does it embed so that others can print it as, as well? Yes. So if you download uh, into download to PDF, that is what people are printing. So once you create something into PDF, um, that's what other people see. And so I noticed a little bit on the presentation, the slides that we had up, I had a different font loaded in my Google Drive, uh, and it didn't come over. But if you download this or if you publish this, you're good to go. So uh, your, your, your customers or whoever's watching is going to see what, what they need to see. Um, so that's how that works. OK, next up is, uh, so that was a text box. And you can do so many things with it. Let's see what else we can do. So alignment is here. So if you need uh, the text to be sort of center or right aligned or left aligned, you can do that. Uh, you have your bullets and lists. And just uh, you know, click down and kind of uh, look at each one. I think for the most part, you probably have more settings here than you can shake a stick at. Um, you can automatically say, OK, this text box, I want to make it into two columns. And then it'll automatically break it into two columns. Did you see that? So that's really nice for, um, um, for if you're making sort of newsletters or whatnot. Let's see if you had a font that was available in Google, but not necessarily on my computer. I had to download. And yeah, Rock Salt. I like Rock Salt. That's a good font. I think you'll find it in there uh, because Lucid Press ties into the Google Font Library, so you should be OK. Or there are very similar ones to Rock Salt. Uh, I'm a big Rock Salt fan as well. Let's see, I might not have it here, but you can find something that's very similar. So again, talking about creation, I used, uh, I used to create a lot when I was a social studies teacher. So um, you know, newsletters, uh, but also handouts and activities. So here's a funky kind of you know, typewriter font, and it works pretty well. Um, you can warp, you can link, you can do all these different things. So kind of just spend some time learning the tool um, by just using it and, and sort of playing around. Uh, Dottie has a question, does it work well on a Chromebook? You bet. And that's one of the, uh, that's one of the reasons we love it so much, because we have lots of Chromebooks, um, and it works in the browser. So again, this is not something that downloads. It just works in your browser. I would highly recommend that you use a Chrome or the Chrome browser. Um, I, would, um, I would stay away from Internet Explorer. That's, that's all I'm going to say about that. So take, take it or leave it, I guess. All right, let's look at an image then. So I have my text box. Let's see, I, I'm going to scale it up a little bit. Um, so I'm going to down the font, something more appropriate. We have it in two columns. That looks good. Uh, next tool up here, I'm dragging in an image. And what you're dragging in is a placeholder. Um, and that's right, Doug. I'm with you, Internet Explorer. It just doesn't work. So uh, in a placeholder, we're dragging in a placeholder. Um, it's going to show you all the images that you have already used. So that's really f helpful. So if you're using a bunch of symbols, um, you know, or kind of icons or whatever in your newsletters, they'll be there for you already, kind of preloaded. And you can hover over and get a really good idea of what they look like. Um, and all you got to do is you just click on it, and you say, that's the image that we want, and, and in it goes. Um, now, notice when you have the image selected, you have the image tools over here. So one of the things that you can do for the image is you can edit the mask. And so notice down here, and I don't want to, I'm not the skirting sort of copyright violations here. And this one happens to have a watermark on it. But you might have something else that you want to mask. And so some of the things that you can then quickly do is you can mask an image, um, and you can make it look exactly the way you want. Um, and then you can kind of remove unwanted, unwanted things. I cut the tail off there a little bit, but there it is. Where is the cat? Good question. Let's see if we can find another image. I don't know if I have a cat in here. One of the things that you can do is you can uh, search from all your images, uh, images that are in this document. So if you're going to sort of repeat it, um, you can look at archived stuff. You can look at private images. And you can also look at team images. And so the team images, uh, if you have that turned on, and that's for your Google Apps team. Uh, if you create a team, you can then have like a batch of images that are available to you. Um, but so here's an image of Dave. Let's see another good image to pull in. Let's pull in our, our Google Drive image. 
right? So you can put that in. And notice when you are selecting an image that you can then kind of scale it if it's scalable, uh, if it's a high resolution image, but you can pretty much do whatever you want with it. You can then also place it exactly where you want it, uh, even though that's within the text box that you were uh, before. And yes, uh, Dejan, I'm not 100% sure how to say your name. From Google Disk, that's right. So if I'm going into my images, I can say yes, uh, pull it in from um, a, a Google Google Images. That's the next next option down. But you can also quickly search from a Google search. You can search for cat right from within the right from within the search window. So let's see if we can get this cat to come in. So obviously that took the cuteness factor. We'll take take rid of the mouse. This took the cuteness factor of this document up by like 100%, right? So there you go. There's your cat for the day. There's your cat attacks. But again, notice when you select this object, which is very different than what you work with in Word, you can then do some different things over here. So you can um, you can stretch. You can have original size. You can um, you know, scale it to fit. You can do all these different things. You can put a border on there if you wanted to. So you can have a border on the cat. Uh, you can select which style of border you want it to be. So solid, stripes, whatever. You can increase the radius, which makes it for soft corners. You can turn a, a shadow on, which depending on your image there may look good or not. Uh, and then you can link it. So you can link the image to something if you wanted to. So possibilities are there. Let's see. Okay, Peggy. Later. Can you show us how you would bring a Lucid chart document into Lucid Press? Sure, absolutely. I missed that from Glenn. Uh, so yet, yeah, just remind me. We'll get there. Uh, get get there. Well, I guess I already have it. I think. Let's let's try another document. So, in Lucid Chart, you can download your your document. Whatever you work on in Lucid Chart, you download that as a high resolution PNG. Let's see if I have something. Might not have it there, so I can I can certainly. I thought I saw a flow chart in here, but maybe not. Okay, I don't want to scroll around too long. We can definitely make that happen here in a minute. Yeah, so download your chart. Yeah, so Peggy, you're right. So download a, a flow chart, for example, uh, as a high resolution transparent PNG file from Lucid Chart, and then drag it into Lucid Press, and you're set. And I would highly recommend that for, um, you know. Um, if you're working a PowerPoint or any kind of presentation, that's that's what I do. I create my flow chart, especially if it's a flow chart or a Venn diagram or anything like that in Lucid uh, Chart, bring it into to another application. Okay, so let's uh, see what else. So we talked about a digital document. Uh, so we want a video. Um, so again, you bring in this video uh, place uh, holder. Um, yep, Sherry Edwards for sure. Does the text wrap around the image? Yes, absolutely, uh, it does. If you have, let's see, let's, excuse me, Patty's question. If you have a Lucid chart published online then embedded into a Lucid Print Study, Lucid Print Study. Uh, um, no. So you can't really take, not that I know of, you can't really take the embedded sort of or the published. You have to download it. So yeah, there's, you're going to have to update your chart then as a static because it's going to treat it. Lucid Press is going to, it's going to treat your thing as a static image. Um, but that's okay. Uh, for text only, the English alphabet. Uh, good question. You're maybe asking about like Cyrillic font, right, for Russian or something like that. Uh, not 100% sure, but if you're a PC or whatever you're on, right, so Cyrillic, if you can load that font, if you have that font file, then you'd be good to go. So you should be good to go. Uh, Peggy's question, yes, yeah, so you just need the URL for the YouTube video, not the embed code. Yeah, here's how we do it. So we're importing um, from YouTube, so I'm going to open up YouTube. Um, it has to be the uh, a YouTube file, so it doesn't uh, it doesn't do it doesn't do anything else. I'm going to pick one of my own videos. Let's see, video manager. Oh, I'm in the wrong account. Okay. How convenient. OK, we'll just take whatever YouTube video then. Will Wheaton on Start Talk. Good enough. OK, so here's what I do. <clears throat> I just grab the URL up at the top, copy it, come back to my document, paste it in, click OK, and there's my Start Talk. Love it. 
give us a thumbs up. See how easy that was? Then you can resize it. Now here's the cool part, right? Obviously, and I tell this in, as a joke, obviously when you print this document out, your video is not going to play, but uh, um, it works on your digital document. Even if you send this over to someone as a PDF, uh, it should play. So depending on, depending on how they have their PDF stuff set up. For sure if you publish it. So if you publish it out, it'll play, uh, play for them. Can you adjust the size of the video? Yeah, so notice when I select the video, it just becomes like any other object. So I can resize it, do whatever I want. So I can have it really teeny tiny small, or I can fill uh, the bottom uh, half of the, the page. You know, whatever I want, whatever I need. And so then um, notice the blue guides here. You have blue guides, and then when you grab the object, notice how I have that might not come through on the screen share, but you're going to get these placeholder lines that show up that tells you that, yes, now it's in the center, and so on and so forth. If I wanted to, I can also then place stuff on top. So notice how, let's deal with the cat. So we'll come back with the cat, take the border off, and I want the cat, now the cat is behind the video, but I want the cat to sort of sit up and look at the video. All I have to do on the video, or all I have to do here is I just, um, just right click on it and I say, bring it to the front, see, bring to the front, maybe that doesn't work with the video, it should work, let me see here, bring, bring to back, and then bring to front, sometimes when you're doing demos, so maybe that doesn't work with a video, but with images it's going to work for you, so now the Google logo is behind the cat, so maybe not for the image embed, but it is, yeah. I tried sending the video to the back, but who knows? Who knows? It is what it is. I still think it's pretty cool that you can embed a video in your document, so that's where I stop. I just, I just take it and I, and I leave. You can still do whatever you want. Again, notice the main difference when you're in a document that's made for page layout and a document that's made for just words. You can do so many more things with it. Okay. <laughs> so we're still on with the cat. Okay, here we go. So next one, so that was a video. You can also insert a bunch of shapes. So if you're going to use uh, shapes in your production or if you uh, want to make like a nice looking corner for your um, newsletter, you know, just kind of a graphical element, you can say, okay, I want this tab here at the bottom. Um, <clears throat> I don't really want a border on it, but I want the, um, I want kind of a simple gradient fill, and I'd like for it to be kind of, you know, we'll go with pink for Valentine's Day today, and then we want it to go up to even lighter pink at, you know, whatever angle, and then we're going to go to opacity, and we're going to drag it down, and then, and then we're going to send that to the back. See, so now we create a little cute element there. Now that the cat is not really playing well because it's not super transparent, but there you go. So you could, I'll show you here in the in the in the newsletter templates that we can look at. Uh, let's demonstrate all the features in the newsletter. Yeah, that's right. So that's a shape, you know. So you've got lots of shapes there. Then you can play with those shapes if you wanted to. Uh, next one, uh, you can put in buttons. The buttons are sort of hot buttons. So if you wanted to. Uh, uh, put something in. They already have the graphics for, for Twitter, so if you're building that in your newsletter, for example, you know, the logo for uh, Twitter is already there, and then you would come over here, and you would then, in the, in the, um, over on the right-hand side, you would link it. So you would say, okay, go to, take my URL for my Twitter page, paste it in there, good to go. That makes sense? So what I just created here was a hot button. So if I now click on that, and when I'm in the document, I have to hold on my shift key um, and my command key, and then I click on it, it'll open up my um, my Twitter profile. So that's that's a cool way of like hot linking your document, making it look really nice, and they have some of that built in already. So if you Facebook, Google Plus, and then some of these hot button action items. So if you wanted a symbol for home, for example. Uh, they're also vectors, so see how they, that scaled really nice. Like, just it doesn't you don't have to worry about the resizing. And then I want that to be green. Um, and then you can do whatever you want. Place it maybe somewhere. Does that make sense? Right. Maureen says handy link back to school website. Perfect. That's exactly it. So you know if you're working on your newsletter, and I'll show you my newsletter up here. 
I kind of have that in the links up here. Uh, and so I might just kind of go in and, and add that as a feature where they just click on it, like the Twitter thing or whatever. Um, I still like writing it out. Some people are still uh, getting used to sort of what, uh, what some of these uh, newfangled things are um, as we go. Uh, okay, and Patty says, I would imagine you could hyperlink the credit below the image if it's published live, like the traditional format. Yeah, for sure. If you're using an image um, that is not uh, free stock photography, that I, that's probably what I would do. Although, if I may, I want to show you something in our Google Drive. What I've done for our, our teachers at Kenston, I've put together a stock photography library with I think we have about 3,000 free to use stock photos and so you should be seeing a bunch of stock photos here. They're all high resolution so if you want um, you know a high resolution stock photography off you go and they don't have to use um, you know they, they don't need to attribute that to anything. Um, just a quick handoff, I think this is what I miss most about where I grew up. I wonder if anyone knows what this is. We'll see if uh, someone answers in the in the chat. Does anyone know what kind of uh, plant this is? This is used to fill um, the neighboring sort of fields where I grew up. So I missed that. So I I like that enough. Yeah, Sherry, you're right. It's canola. But what is what's the actual name of it? Because the plant isn't called canola. So that's the um, that's the the quiz for today. Beer grass. Uh, okay, I don't know. Peggy, yeah, that would be in Sweden. <coughs> we call it raps, like this, R-A-P-S, but it's actually rape seed and rape seed equals canola, canola oil. So you make canola oil from rape seed, but the actual flower is called rape seed. All right, that was too much nerd trivia for today. Okay, a few more things we can put in. So we put in a video, we put in a um, sort of a shape, a cat, some link, some text. Next up, you can put in a table. So if you need a table in your uh, document, you have it. And again, notice over here on the right, I like how it resizes very easily. So you can shift your uh, table around, put it exactly where you want. And then over on the right-hand side, you can then insert rows before, after, columns before, after, and you can also say, in this table, I want only three rows, but maybe seven columns. And, and notice how it resizes. It's beautiful. It's a lot like uh, pages on the Mac if you're using a Mac. Um, and then you can merge and do all the different things. So you could say, we're going to merge these things, merge these. So functions just like a very functional table. So if you want to put that stuff in there. Okay, love it. And then finally, and I think this was a question before, I can insert things from my Google Drive. Now you have to have, obviously then, you have to have connected your Google Drive. So you have to have connected your Google Drive uh, into Lucid Press. But again, remember, you can authenticate Lucid Press with your Google account. And if you do that, then they uh, put it uh, together. Maureen, you're absolutely right. Uh, way more functional than tables and docs. Um, my recommendation to you is that you should never use a table in, a, in, a, uh, in either Google Documents or um, Word, uh, Microsoft Word, because it doesn't work super well. It doesn't style it. Okay, so here I am in my Google Drive, and I can now insert things from my Google Drive if I wanted to, um, um, usually pictures. So, all right. Sharon says, I'm loving Lucid Press later. Will you talk about the difference between free and paid access? Yes. Uh, the quick and dirty there is that with the totally free access, they're going to limit you on um, a couple things. One is uh, sort of being able to publish as many documents as you want. Uh, two, um, they limit you on the amount of objects that you have within your document. Um, but the question really, the philosophical question is, are you, is this a tool you're going to use all the time? The answer to that is yes, then uh, I would um, recommend that you pay for it. Evernote is another tool, for example. I, I pay for Evernote. I use it all the time because it, it changes my life. Is this the paid version? Yes. Uh, so if you are within a Google Apps for Education, if you're in an educational setting, just uh, give Lucid Press a shout and they will uh, make it so. So uh, if you're in any kind of school setting, they will give you, if you're a public K-12, they will give you access to the paid version of Lucid Press and Lucid Chart 
for free. So there you go. All right. Um, moving on. Let's go backwards a while. So now we've looked at. Uh, no, Patty should work for private too, but you'll have to. I would. I would contact them. So because um, I don't. I don't work for Lucid Press, so that that'll be up for them. So uh, give them a give them a ho holler. Brad Hanks would be a good good person to talk to. He's on Twitter. Uh, he is. I am Brad Hanks. Um, and he works for Lucid Press and Lucid uh, Chart, so he should be able to help you out. If you have a paid version from Lucid Chart, from Brad Hanks, I said it work for Lucid Press too. Uh, good question. They're they're two different tools, same company, but again, I would get with Brad and ask, and uh, he will he will help you out. All right, so let's go backwards. Uh, I'm going back to my documents, uh, and I really want to uh, to do something else. So I want to look at uh, some templates that are available to me, and um, I'll show you one. Well, I'll I'll just show you the the template. So if I'm in a Lucid document, let's see. How do we get into the templates? Now they move things around. Here we go. Back to documents. New document. So I want to get into the the templates. I use Lucid Press like every week, and still, when they change things up on me, um, it is what it is. Okay, here we go. So I just click. That's right. So I just click, just click document, and I get my uh, template chooser. And so what I ended up choosing before was just a blank print document, but you have all of these other ones as well. So you have all of these um, reports over here on the right. You have your categories. So you have a, a blank, and then you have your brochures, you have business cards, you have flyers, postcards, letterhead, stationery, photo books. And so someone asked about the formats. This is where you can kind of start out, posters, reports. And then notice you can then go right into design for tablets, mobile, and PC. So these are digital documents. They're not meant to be printed, so they might look a little bit different. And then you can go into custom stuff. Um, and you can then set up some custom templates yourself. So if you have a news uh, letter template that you really like, um, you can uh, start with that. So I'm going to go into just uh, well, let's see one of the let's go into a newsletter here. I'll just click a newsletter, and you choose from a template. Uh, the template will load. Some of these templates are very large. Um, and so it might take a little bit to load, and uh, it might, it might, they might have too many things going on at one time. But it's a pretty good starting point, and I would definitely urge you that this is a good place for you to start learning, um, you know, learning Lucid Press. Lucid Chart is the same way, but to learn it, you know, so you have your data up here, and kind of just looking at some of the design features that they use. So like a nice big header here, you know, or, or a heading, and then kind of some text and. Um, you can kind of scroll through, and they have some callouts and, and whatnot. And then these images, when you click on the image, you can just add an image there. So if you want to put your own images there, um, you simply come over to the image chooser. Uh, you can even create a slideshow by adding additional images to that, and, and so on and so forth. But a great starting place um, if you're not comfortable with uh, designing uh, newsletters, and then you can make it your own uh, because everything in here is just a drag and drop. So it's just a text box, and you just move it around. And here's a good example. Someone asked about, does the text move? Um, so here's a good example of that. So if I place it in the middle, see how the, the, the copy text kind of just moved on its own and, and pushed it around. So it works really, really well. Um, and that's about all there's to it. Now, a lot of people ask, how do you learn more? Where are the, the where are the links to all of these things? Uh, I think Peggy put some pretty good links um, in the uh, presentation already that you can access to get a good idea of um, of how to get started. Um, if not, my recommendation is just to open a newsletter template and start playing around with it, and then go from there. Um, Peggy said, "Can you get an embed code to add your newsletter to a blog?" Yeah, for sure. So when you go and you uh, you publish it. You would say, how do you want to publish this? And then you, uh, you would click Publish, and then you can choose either to get a link or an embeddable code or whatnot, so for sure. I'm not going to click Publish, because publishing takes a little while sometimes. 
Um, but yeah, you can uh, choose any format that you want, depending on what, how, your, how your website is set up. So typically, the website that I use for our teachers, I don't embed it. I just put the link there, and they download it, or they can sort of link to the, the, the digital document as opposed to trying to embed it, because our teachers come in on a mobile device, come in on something else, and so I want them to, to, to get the best experience. Um, Wes says, I'm going to share this with a school secretary, um, continuing to do our newsletter. Yeah, this is excellent, Wes. Here's one that I helped um, our one school to do. They did just that, and they said, well, we need a new format for our newsletter, so I just helped them with the uh, kind of the preview, so we made a template for them. So this is for our Kenston uh, Intermediate School, and uh, so the secretary fills that out, and that's their newsletter. And you know, the 401 professional development, bus duty, um, guidance, collaboration, dates, things like that done. So then it's easy to do, um, no problem. All right, no problem, Wes. We'll see you later. Thanks for, thanks for joining. Hopefully you, um, you liked it. Um, there was one thing I wanted to share. Yeah, so if you're in teaching, how did we use it with students? Because I haven't really addressed that. Um, we've worked a bunch of different projects. Uh, the latest one was working with our phys ed staff. Instead of doing a um, three-fold pamphlet for print, we asked them to do a digital document. So this is our example or our exemplar, um, just highlighting using images some of the different sections that we wanted them, so three critical elements of the sport. Uh, we wanted them to have some common mistakes for the sport. Um, and then we wanted them to advocate, so why should they play soccer, you know, what soccer means to me, and then we asked them to put in a video at the end. So this was just our exemplar for them to kind of take a look at as um, students. And then we had a whole grading rubric and everything that went, went along with that. So, all right, I think that wraps it up. I think we're coming up to the hour here. So uh, if you have any more questions, I will, um, I will address them here as fast as they come in. Um, Maureen says, can you tell us the image search within LucyPress does a CCY? It is wide open Google search, yeah. So uh, pretty much, I mean, when you look at copyright, uh, if you are following the letter of the law, every single image on the internet is copyrighted. So unless you specifically go out and find uh, a, a big library of um, non-copyrighted material, then anything within the Google search is going to be copyrighted. Uh, Peggy's question, is there an age requirement for students over 13 years? Uh, the, the law there says that a student 13 or below may not uh, sort of create their own account, but that's really up to each service, and I would definitely check with the uh, school board policy there if you're at a school. The way we uh, do it at Kenston is that um, we are administering accounts to them, so they all have Google accounts, all uh, K-12 kids have a Google account, so as long as they use that Google account to authenticate into Lucid Press, they're okay. So that's how we solve it, um, because we're managing those accounts. That's right, yeah, so Maureen, so you have GAFE, GAFE accounts or Google Apps for Education, uh, parents sign off, and uh, you use those for Lucid Press. That's beautiful. Let me see, um, let me know if you can see this one. I just pulled up uh, a, a an incognito window, and when I click login to LucidPress, hopefully you see the login screen. Right here at the bottom, you can log in with your Google account or your Yahoo account, and so if students or you just click Google account, it'll do a cross-linking, it'll authenticate with Google account, so it's great. Yep. Yeah, that's right, Peggy. So if uh, the kids have a GAFE account or Google account through your school, Right, has to be through the school, not a Gmail account. So, I mean, they can, right? Our, our kids lie all the time, right? So all, most of the kids in our middle school and below have a Facebook account, and they just said, yes, I'm older than 13. But um, what we do is we just issue everyone a, a Google account, and then off you go. Um, you can also see it right on the Create New when you are in Google Docs. It's a choice. Yeah, that's right. So, Maureen, you're right. So if you're in uh, Google, uh, that has to be enabled by your Google administrator, though. But if I'm in Google, you should see it in your um, in your Create New. So if you're looking at my menu, hopefully you can see it there. I can create both Lucid Chart and Lucid Press from within your Google Drive. So it's great. Kids get in it very easily. Don't have to remember another URL to go to. 
Uh, Sophia, even if email is not activated in Apps for Education, uh, yes, should work. As long as they have a Google account, don't necessarily need the email portion to be active because it authenticates with your Google account. And then, if, so if you have email turned off um, for students, then that's okay. Uh, I'll share with you what we do at Kenston. Again, we have um, we have it wide open. The only thing that we don't let them do is uh, Google Plus, and the only reason there is because Google does cross check, and so. Um, that can jeopardize our whole uh, directory or our whole Google Apps domain. But other than that, uh, that is the only thing that we block for our students. So kindergarten through 12th grade, 3,300 students have Google Apps uh, account, email, calendar, Google Drive, the whole, the whole shebang. Um, so and feel free to ask, ask, ask the justification there uh, if, if you want to at some point. But I don't want to. I don't want to go over here. Okay, Peggy, can you repeat the information about how people get free Lucid Press account as an educator? Do we? Yes. Call Brad. Say, hey, we're a school. Set us up. So it's something that you do. Uh, you um, enable it in the back end. Uh, I could certainly show that, but you have to enable it in the back end of your uh, Google Apps for Education uh, domain domain admin control, and so it's not something you can do on your own. So you essentially um, authenticate the school or the K-12 in, you know, the institution uh, with Lucid Press and Lucid Chart, and then they know that when someone from Kenson Apps, for example, one of our students uh, join, then they are to receive the full version. Hopefully that an answered your question. Okay, Sophia, many sites request email confirmation. Uh, LucidPress does not. So LucidPress and LucidChart just authenticate with your Google Apps domain. So as long as you have, if so, step one, you know, sign into your Google account. Step two, uh, log in using your Google account, and it authenticates. There's no email um, that happens. It's just a handshake between your Google account and your LucidPress. Uh, Peggy, that's a good question. I would check with Brad. Um, so that's that's what I would do. Yeah. So check with Brad Hanks. He would be a good uh, person to check with for the full version. It should work. I mean, as long as it's your, um, you know, your educator account, I would imagine. Um, for us, it was pretty simple. You know, everyone's going to be KensonApps.org, so. Um, it's easy for them to authenticate that. How about this? What do we do? Um, let's do call, keep calm, and use. Press. We have to make that smaller. Is that the right green? I don't know. All right. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, appreciate it. Any more questions that I haven't answered? Feel free to always reach out on Twitter uh, or send me an email. Um, let me see. And my, my Twitter is here for the chat. Uh, I'll pull up my uh, contact information. You can find that here. So feel free to reach out anytime. I'm happy to help. Um, after Monday, after our professional development day that I'm running at Kenston, uh, we should be good to go. Uh, should be um, should have a lot more uh, time to to do other things. So we'll see. Um, thank you so much. Appreciate. It. Yeah, I think it's Brad at Lucid Chart or Brad at Lucid Tools or something like that. Thank you for the feedback. Appreciate it. Have a wonderful Valentine's Day, everyone, for those of us here in the US. All right, I'm going to turn my uh, thing off here. Let's see, how did I do that? Video, whoops, going to tools, application sharing, stop sharing. OK, there we go. Thank you so much. And I'm going to hand back over to the moderators, right?
Lori, Peggy? Yes, thanks. Andreas, yep. yes. I'm trying to find out. There we go. I, Andreas, you did a wonderful job capturing those questions. I don't have any others, I don't think. You asked most of the ones, if not all the ones, that I was able to, to grab from chat. So we will wrap up. And next week, we have a featured teacher, Mary Beth Hertz, from the Science Leadership Academy on Saturday, the 21st of February. On the 28th of February, Tammy Moore is going to do a presentation on student study skill tools. And on March 7th, I lead you super team of librarians, life binders for librarians and everybody else. So those are the next three upcoming shows. The Learning Revolution Project is Steve Hargadon's newest venture. He's gathered all his PD resources together at one place, including the Host Your Own webinar series. You can host your own session in Blackboard Collaborate as long as you make your session public. You can nominate a featured teacher at this link tinyurl.com slash cr2o live featured teacher nominate without the e at the end. You can nominate yourself as well. Each month we have a featured teacher, most months. As you leave the session, your browser should open the Classroom 2.0 Live survey. And there's a direct link for the survey. You can take the survey link from the chat box that Peggy just pasted there. Or the survey is also in the live binder in that resources tab at the bottom. So there are three places to get the survey. Once you do that, at the bottom of the survey form, there's a professional development certificate available. Um, once you put in your name and your email address, please make sure the email is a personal email account rather than a school email account. Um, what's nice about these new certificates is that where it says name here, actually it will print your name once you get the file back. The video collection and audio collection of recordings are on iTunes U. Yeah, it is a good idea that you submit your request for the surveys as soon as possible because they're processed in a group and it's much, much harder if you submit the uh, information after the show is completed. So you can listen to the recordings or watch and listen to the recordings from iTunes U. There's also an RSS feed link for the show archives on the Weebly site. So many ways to get to the recordings. Again, very special thanks to Andreas Johansson, the Steve Hargadon, founder of Classroom 2.0, Teacher 2.0, Future of Education, and the Learning Revolution, to Weebly.com for providing the website, and to, uh, to Blackboard Collaborate for, for our webinar platform, and also to everyone who participated in today's show. Thank you so much for coming. And remember, in order for that recording to process, you do have to exit the session. Bye-bye.